Culture of Ermaji, Higan, Borum Badder, Egonel, um, and you be Maja, Glorch Le Truer, Catter, Kainchor, E. Kainchori, um, Er Komoru, I guess, uh, Major Hechema, Le Lin Kogudna uh, Duchroni. You're welcome here to the Pallor Donald Forum, um, where we are discussing. Labour, the theme of Labour must wait no longer. Um, and we are discussing this in the context of the war for independence or the Black and Tan War. I'd like to introduce Pauline Conroy, who is a social researcher and writer from Dublin. She's lived and worked and studied in England, Italy, France, Belgium, and North Africa, and has extensive international knowledge. Her most recent publication is a book titled A Bit Different. Uh, disability in Ireland, and she is uh, currently researching a book on eugenics. Liz Gillis is uh, an eminent historian, and she has written extensively on Irish history and is the author of a number of his of books covering the revolutionary decade from 1913 to 23. Dr. Conor McCabe previously worked in the Dáil research as, as a research associate. He has written extensively in both on Irish labour history. I uh, and Irish finance is involved in activist education, working with political trade union and community groups from Derry to Kerry. Ona Morahu, former political correspondent with Radio Nagelta, is a journalist who had regular column with him on Publact and is a lifelong activist and campaigner for Irish language and culture. Um, it's fashionable in liberal and indeed in Euro fanatic circles today to decry nationalism to dismiss the struggle for democracy at a national level as if it was some form of fascist heron folkism, currently denounced, of course, as populism. Woe betide anyone who cast doubts on the supposedly obvious merits of the European Union, the primacy of the market, and the principles of global neoliberalism. But the demand for national sovereignty challenges the institutional essence of the new world order, which is designed to preserve and expand the reach of European and North American-centered capitalism. And that is why that demand must be distorted, derided, and denounced. And necessarily in the case of Ireland, these modern prejudices, which reflect the abandonment of the ideas of national freedom as advanced in 1916, have to be read back into history so that the struggles against imperialism and colonialism, which saw the emergence of sovereign nation states throughout Europe, can be equated with the national exclusiveness and racial purity illusions of Nazis and others, with backwardness instead of the progressive advance it actually represented. This rejection of national sovereignty and the idea of subordinating the demand capitalism to the needs of sovereign nations has even been adopted by some who assert that they are on the left, that is, that they speak for the working class against capitalism. So in Britain, even as the working class showed that it was not enamored of the European Union and its global uh, neoliberalism, the Labour Party there was unable to break from its spell. Not only the Blairites, like Keir Starmer, argued this line, but even left-wingers like John MacDonald and Diane Abbott undermined Jeremy Corbyn's instinctive distrust of EU supranationalism by joining with the Euro-liberals in their demand for a second referendum. Inevitably, as social democratic parties throughout Europe abandoned both national democracy and indeed the class demands of organized labor, their influence declined and their voting support plummeted. By leaving the issues of national democracy to the right, the social democratic left did not undermine the demand for national sovereignty. It just made itself irrelevant in that demand and strengthened the right. And in Ireland too, misled by the demand of not recreating a hard economic border in our partition country, even Sinn Féin, which had hitherto championed national sovereignty, came close to abandoning that stance as it campaigned against Brexit and for the entrenchment of the EU in Ireland, even as it felt the need to invent the fig leaf of reforming what is, in fact, an irreformable European Union. That contradiction will clearly play itself out 
in that party, as it will find that EU rules forbid the state to interfere with the market or take a direct role in job creation, industrial investment, and balanced development in general, something very important in rural Ireland. Already, there are signs that that particular worm. We should remember, though, that this dismissal of the vital importance of national sovereignty is not a new phenomenon on the so-called left. Traditionally, socialism had been seen as the coming together of working people, irrespective of nationality, in a common cause against capitalism. The colonized peoples were essentially lesser peoples in this outlook. It was a worldview which Lenin strongly disagreed with. Inevitably, the 1916 Rising was the focal point of much of the discussion on this issue. Prominent Bolsheviks like Karl Radek dismissed the Rising as a mere putsch, something the working class should not be interested in. But Lenin took a different view. In his preparations for the 1920 Common Plan Congress, Lenin argued that the Rising deserved the support of the socialist movement and that its only weakness had been the fact that it occurred before the demand for revolution had matured throughout Europe. In taking this stance, Lenin was in tune with the arguments advanced by Marx and Engels before him, including Marx's astute recognition that a nation which oppresses another cannot itself be free. Marx saw this as vital if the English working class were to defeat their native capitalist enemy, relying so much on it for its profits, on its exploitation of its colonies. And Lenin took this further by recognizing that the struggle against colonialism was an essential component of the struggle to overthrow the imperialist capitalist structures of Europe. By definition, such a struggle against colonialism is not confined to the working class, but the long-term aims of that class are, of course, sharply different. Lenin, theorizing in his Common Plan Congress preparations, was not from supporting these struggles because other social forces were involved, even in leadership positions. But he was clear that the working class could not and should not limit its demands against colonialism to the immediate issue only. James Connolly was equally clear. He understood that republicanism was not a matter of changing the national character of the oppressors, but of asserting that the wealth of the nation belonged to all the nation. It is an idea, of course, that had its basis in the French Revolution, which encouraged Irish revolutionaries like Wolfe Tone to call for the ending of sectarian divisions, which were vital for England's rule over Ireland, and to replace the denominations of Catholic, Protestant, and dissenter by the common name of Irish. Today, of course, we would expand that to include Irish women, as Connolly insisted on in the proclamation which addresses Irish men and Irish women alike. But Connolly also understood that some of those he allied with in the Rising might have other class interests to pursue once national freedom was won. He reminded the citizens' army that they should hold on to their guns just in case. Above all else, as George Gilmore explained in his first of pamphlet in 1966, Connolly staked out Labour's claim of right to participate in the leadership of the national struggle. It was both a terrible tragedy and an abject abandonment of duty that saw his successes stand aside as the struggle developed. Workers, socialists, trade unionists, all played a vital part in the fight for independence. But organized labor, industrial and political, watched on from the sidelines. In this regard, perhaps the title of this seminar is not quite accurate. While Labour Party defenders moan uh, being told to wait in the 1918 election, the reality is that Labour took the decision to wait. It did not aspire to lead the national revolution because, I believe, it was afraid that the movement in the north would split under the sectarian strain. But it split anyhow, and it ushered in the carnival of reaction that Connolly had warned would be the consequence of partition. 
a cautious, xenophile style, semi-radical republicanism, played the role in Ireland that was played by social democracy elsewhere in Europe. But that republicanism has long since subordinated itself to the market and the profit motive. Today, Sinn Féin is the inheritor of that strand of Irish politics. But it can't succeed in breaking with the exploitive imperialist allowed system of the past on its own. We put too much emphasis on political parties, their histories and their personalities. But what really matters are the social forces that can be mobilized. While labor was originally founded to give the organized working class a political voice, it always spoke timorously after Connolly's death and has now totally abandoned that role. But a real change in Irish society, one which goes back to the inspiration of 1916 and turns it into reality, can only be brought about, as Gilmore pointed out, by united action of the Labour and Republican movements, bringing United Islanders, political trade unionists, environmental activists, feminists, rural development campaigners, Gaelfacht and Langold right campaigners, those who demand democracy and equality together. If Labour waited after 1916, that is to its shame. The task now is to make sure that the social forces which need radical change together. Sinn Féin can play a leading part in that, but not on its own, and not without facing up to the reality of the European Union and the need to reaffirm that we serve neither King nor Kaiser as we fight to build a genuine, united, independent, non-sectarian republic of all the people of Ireland. I think labor as a commodity and its labor movement of the 19th century had appeared in Ireland with great force in the lockout of 1913 and the uh, citizen army of 1916. But these, are, these were defeated, these movements. But there were earlier signs of revolt and insurgency in Irish society that I think have been much neglected. And these were the revolts among the peasantry, using manifestos and boycotts and so-called outrages against exploitative landlords and particularly their agents. And these uh, insurgent protests among the peasants did not generally have any organic link with the emerging labor movement. And I think that's an area that needs further exploration. Um, but it's um, interesting to observe that even in the construction of the Dublin's Custom House in the 1790s, that was riven with labour disputes when uh, the promoters and Gandon, the architect, brought in stonemasons and carpenters from England and obliged them. They were obliged by the existing combination, which is the precursor of labour, to um, join the Dublin combinations and pay dues. So I think that there is a long but thin history leading up into um, the period of war against the Black and Tans. My view is that what's very problematic in the first years, or first decades of the 20th century is that there were two modes of production in Ireland, it can be argued. One was the capitalist mode with labor as a commodity, but then this pre-capitalist mode in which waged work was only partially remunerated or partially manifest. And the example uh, that I would take of that is women who uh, from the earliest years of the century, right up until just after the Second World War, were still working inside what you would call the domestic economy. That is, they worked, but not always for individual wages. And an example is the um, majority of women working in agriculture, the 85,000 women working as servants, and of whom 63,000 only had a part wage. Um, and then were 10,000 nuns and religious as well as thousands of children coercively laboring in the farms of 
religious congregation. And it was not really until after World War II that a majority of women who were economically active had mainly abandoned domestic service, work as assisting relatives, and joined menfolk in becoming actually a majority among emigrants from Ireland rather than a majority in labour. But among the contexts I think we have to take into account is the wave of Spanish flu, which is very relevant now, um, which killed 20,000 people between 1918 and 1919. But I want to give some examples of maybe um, progressive forces in the emergence of labour. Um, and for example, by 1918, the Irish Women Workers Union had over 5,000 members. Um, and the Nurses Union formed in 1919 became a branch of the Irish Women Workers Union. And Helena Maloney, uh, in biographies, a militant actress and activist, recalled seizures, calls for the seizure of the Arigna mines, for the Soviets of Limerick, for the occupation of the Nocklong dairies and activities of the Irish Labour Party and Trade Union Congress. Um, but I want to take a more obscure example, perhaps, um, which is the example of the Irish Asylum Workers' Union, which was founded in 1917 by separating from the English Asylum Workers' Union. And they were one of the largest groups of state employees, numbering thousands of men and women across all of Ireland. And it's notable that they were not employed by religious orders. Religious orders specifically rejected working with the insane, or as they were called, the lunatics of the time. They wanted nothing to do with them. So it was in fact the state, the British state, which established these district asylums in every corner of Ireland. Now, so great was their success was that when Quadran Asylum was being built, it was made a condition of employment that no union membership would be allowed. So already employers were trying to anticipate the emergence of collectivized labor. In its, its peak years were 1917 to 21, and it had some success in negotiating minimum conditions of employment in 1920, reducing the week to 56 hours a week and a minimum wage of 60 pounds for men and 46 for women. But perhaps of particular relevance to um, the Padre O'Donnell School uh, Forum is that Monaghan Asylum in uh, 1919, under the oversight of Republican Socialist Padre O'Donnell, the asylum attendants embarked on strike action and raised the red flag over the building. This short-lived Monaghan Soviet of 1919 actually predated the Limerick Soviet and was the first um, commune of its type in Ireland. Um, I want to mention just a bit, a bit about the international context because it's disappointing, I suppose, that during this period um, of turmoil globally, really, um, that there wasn't greater success in Ireland. And there were really very many examples. Um, obviously, Constance Markovitz being elected to Parliament and being the first cabinet woman. Uh, in Western Europe. And I say Western Europe because it, she's widely believed to have been the first member, woman member of a cabinet, but this is actually untrue. Um, the first woman member of a cabinet was Alexandra Kolontai in, with the Bolsheviks when she was made Commissar for Social Welfare in 1917. Um, I'll mention a few other events which doesn't necessarily mean that I agree with them. Uh, they are very, very different ideologically, such as the 1918 formation of the revolutionary Maknavite army in Ukraine, um, the Spartacus uprising and seizure of Berlin, and of particular interest, the uh, 
daughter of Irish emigrants, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, who led the silk workers strike in New Jersey, which did succeed in reducing working hours. And then there was the example of Labour Party members and activists in England, such as the socialist George Lansbury, who was like, somewhat like uh, an early version of Corbyn, but a bit more open-minded, I think. And then in Spain in 1919, there was a general strike uh, of the CNT and UGT unions, and similarly, a general strike in Italy, in which the writer Antonio Gramsci took part. In 1920, there was John Reed's book giving his account of the East and Central European world in his uh, 10 days that shook the world um, from his observations of the Soviet Union. And finally, there was in 1921, and there are, it's very controversial, the Kronstadt, Kronstadt uprising of sailors and workers seeking bread. Now, these many events showed that the context in Ireland in that period was an international turbulence and uprising. But it, I'm unclear whether, whether these had a direct or an indirect influence on what happened in Ireland. Certainly in the case of the establishment of um, Soviets or call for Soviets in Limerick and Monaghan are one um, and also in Cork. But there may be, there may be a deeper influence. I think uh, I want to end here and um, look forward to listening to the um, Liz and Connor's contributions. Could uh, we now move to ask Connor to give his contribution, please? Thanks, Colm. Thanks for this. And uh, like my talk kind of, you know, um, it flows kind of quite well from like Pauline's kind of points. And I do kind of touch upon some of the points that Pauline has has raised. Um, in terms of the period, um, it's a period where um, from 1970 and until 1922 has to be one of the most intense periods for the Irish kind of labour movement, but it's usually kind of put forward as kind of labour must wait. If that's the case, it's a very strange form of waiting. Um, it's it it still remains uh, the most intense kind of period. Um, so during this talk, um, I'll try and uh, briefly kind of touch upon. There's the three kind of general strikes. There's the 1920 local elections. Uh, there's the occupations and the Soviets that Paul kind of touched upon. And then there's the post treaty and the new kind of Irish state itself. So, so I'll try and cover kind of these just in the next kind of 10, 15 minutes. Um, as background, um, the, the kind of First World War led to an expansion in, in like trade unionism um, in Ireland. Um, it went from, from, from 100,000 members in 1916 to 200 and 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 25,000 members uh, by uh, by 1920 uh, there was a definite growing kind of awareness and the class uh, consciousness as well there was a real kind of revival of the pre kind of first world war lack and uh, tactics of kind of direct action and there was a strong um adaption of of James Connolly's um one big union and we see that, you know, with the ITG, like WU. So there is a view out there, and you know, this is a period of great, of great conflict and of kind of contradictions. Um, so there's arguments kind of going on, but there is that promise of industrial union of industrial unionism will lead to a workers' kind of republic. Um, in the words of Emmett O'Connor, for a very brief uh, period. Uh, a Congress, that's the Irish Congress, of the trade unions, transformed from a bunch of the trade unions with no coherent uh, politics, there beyond a few kind of laborist um, assumptions from Britain into potentially, and is and is and is potentially, and industrially um, and like politically in the, in the, uh, integrated movement that's geared uh, there towards kind of tackling kind of reality. Um, so we see from 1916 and like 1917, there's uh, there are food and fuel kind of shortages. Um, 
So the labor movement feels imbued with a social purpose. It's not just wages and and like work uh, conditions. Um, in that raise in that um, rise in like trade unionism, it's it's the ITG, but the EU that it that many kind of benefits and it's many kind of rural a rural kind of, uh, a rural kind of workers. So the ITG by the EU goes from five thousand members. In like 1916, having been kind of decimated by the 1913 kind of lockout, to over 120,000 members just like four years later. This is a time of massive growth and massive um, trade unionism, and these are active members. Again, it's a very strange form of of waiting that is going on. Um, and of course, a wider kind of context is the Russian Revolution, which electrifies the 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 Dickon Labour movement in Ireland completely electrifies it because here we have a workers' kind of republic that is being kind of set up. It's under attack, but it is being kind of set up. Now in Ireland, there are other kind of battles that are going on, and in the, the, the labour movement itself, there is that tension with the unionist members of the labour movement and the nationalist members. But certainly in the South, it's almost to a person, it's a nationalist. Republican um, socialist uh, movement. Um, in terms of of the um, of the of other kind of activities that are going on, you know, there's the there's the now infamous or famous uh, Limerick kind of Soviet that op uh, that operates from from 14th to 27th of April. To, uh, like 1919. Now this has been somewhat kind of written off. By kind of Cahill in his book, Forgotten kind of Revolution, as a emotional and spontaneous kind of protest that was done on nationalist and and humanitarian grounds, rather rather than anything based on socialist or even trade union aims. This completely misses the point. This is being organised by workers and through their through their uh, structures, their own um, organisational uh, structures in terms of the local trades council. And those kind of trade unionism, and um, that was a that was a real threat to the other kind of kind of hierarchy um, in Ireland at the time, which is the which was the the kind of republican kind of movement. So we see kind of workers taking control. It's this argument that has kind of seeped in to kind of Irish history at this time that there's a contradiction with being republican and being socialist, and this wasn't held. By the hundreds of thousands of, of of people at that time, nor is it held in 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 many kind of colonial kind of situations. There's no real uh, angst with a nationalist movement and a Marxist movement in a kind of colonial kind of situation. And Ireland is in this kind of quasi kind of colonial kind of situation. So it's only kind of later on when there's arguments over what constitutes nationalism, what constitutes Irish kind of republicanism, that we get this kind of filtering of these other kind of strands that are very active at that time. Um, and these are seen in the Soviets that, uh, that Pauline kind of touched upon, um, the, uh, the more kind of famous one being kind of brewery. Uh, we make bread, uh, not profits. Regardless of whether these were actual Soviets or not, we can see just first of all, there's the language that's been kind of adapted. And secondly, these are worker organized. So, I mean, like, again, the energy from these things is coming from, like, trade unionists, it's coming from workers themselves. They're taking a, this kind of initiative. We see in terms of a, there's a wave of um, occupations in, like, 1922, um, mainly in, like, Munster. This is similar to what happens. Actually, we saw a similar kind of wave of workplace kind of occupations during the bailout and austerity years here in the South as well. And it'd be interesting to maybe kind of map them, you know, th those kind of occupations that it took place from 2010 until 2014, you know? Uh, so it's interesting how these kind of similar kind of tactics um, were being used then as, as now. Um, the other kind of element of the labor movement uh, was the fact that it, it was able to organize general strikes. And these still remain the, the only kind of general strikes that, that were ever held on the island um, of Ireland um, in terms of their scale. Um, 
there's arguments over whether the um, a, a, the loyalist kind of worker strike it constitutes a general strike or not, but that's for another day's work. So we had three of them, and the very first one it was against conscription, and outside of the north and like Belfast, this is more or less um, adhered to. Uh, transport shuts down, uh, docks kind of shut down. And it's, you know, and it's a overtly kind of political kind of strike that is happening here. Again, organized by the like trade union movement and, and being led kind of by them. In 1920, there's another kind of general strike and it's in, and it's in support of the uh, hunger strikers. Um, they're the like centenary of which is being kind of uh, marked at the moment. So while the hunger strikers are being kind of, there's programs on the RTE about it, there's nothing not a word about the influence and the uh, and the organization and the and the organization of the labor movement at this time and its kind of contribution to the wider kind of thing that's a question for maybe for for kind of another day but it would be interesting if rte spent as much time dealing with the conscription and the uh, hunger striker kind of strikes as you do with the middle class kind of background of of the one or two kind of the one or two kind of hunger strikers who they are kind of talking about. Um, also, Labour takes part in the local elections. It steps away from the 1921 general election, but it, but it did take part in the local uh, uh, in in the 1920 local election, which to date is the last was the last kind of um, election held on the island of Ireland that included all 32 counties. And Labour, uh, Labour candidates, they, they emerged as the second largest voting bloc based on that, on, you know, on, on those results. Around like 30% of seats were won by Sinn Féin, 22% were won by Labour candidates. And then it's 20% by, uh, uh, by unionists. So it's a not insignificant statement in, in terms of like support for labor movement and can labor candidates. Now their policies were ones that kind of ring true even today. Um, good homes for workers, uh, low rents. If this is ringing a bell for anyone, is it? Um, councils to ensure milk supply for children and mothers, given the vote that happened in the in, in the Westminster uh, during the week. I mean, this is like, it, it's a hundred years later and we're still trying just to feed hungry children. Um, scholarships for schools and, 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 and like universities and councils to involve in, in like public works, including kind of house building. Again, this is, this is politics even today. The Sinn Féin kind of program uh, was suitably vague um, to ensure efficiency and purity of Ad, um, administration. You know, what the be Jesus does that mean? You know what I mean? Like this is your usual, just say anything vague, get it over the hump and we get into power and then we'll do stuff, right? To establish and enforce the principle of free and open competition for public kind of appointments. This is hardly, um, you know, life-changing, world-changing kind of stuff forever. I, I, I don't remember this from the storming of the White Palace, you know? Um, so, you know, um, the other one that we deal with in that year, of course, is the munitions strike, where workers on, on the railways said that they would not carry uh, British troops if they were carrying guns. And there's a kind of, there's a revisionism that's going on now in this kind of centenary, that this is all being organized by by Muggle Collins and by like you know, like the, the the IRA, it's absolute nonsense. Um, spent five years kind of researching this. I, I found one letter from like Muggle Collins, and he's saying, "Yeah, it's a good idea, and like fair play to them, but it's their fight." Suddenly, that's been changed into it was all been led by Collins. God knows why. Um, this has been organised by trade unionists on the ground, and it was and it was linked completely linked with the hands-off Russia campaign that was happening in Britain at that time. But like, uh, like in the strike, it's, it's been organized by fucking local branches. And they're looking at, at what the British Labour movement is doing in terms of Russia. 
where Britain is like supplying uh, troops as well as guns uh, to the white kind of Russians. And what the, the labor movement did was that they, they refused to load kind of uh, ships that would, uh, that, were that were destined for the anti, anti-Bolshevik kind of forces. What the Irish movement does, what the Irish kind of trade union movement does, it says that if it's good enough for Russia, then it's good enough for us. So what we have here are British troops also showing up here with guns um, against the consent of the Irish people. Um, so that needs to be stopped as well. And the British trade movement just didn't know how to handle that because it's one thing fighting imperialism when it's thousands of miles away. It's another thing fighting imperialism when it's just across the um, R- Deacon Irish Sea. And it was really awkward for them. This has not been organized by the like, IRA. It's complete nonsense. That's a, that's, that, again, it's trying to take agency from working class people, which is a trope of like Irish, Irish historians. They love doing it, just taking what's agency, examples of agency by working class people in Ireland and snatching it away and saying, that didn't happen. It didn't really work. It was all, you know, Collins kind of pulling strings, absolute cult swallow. Um, then we get into the treaty itself and into the post kind of, um, post kind of war and the Irish war kind of period. Um, so what happens here is that here we see a breakdown really in terms of the Irish kind of labor movement. Um, a lot of the grassroots would have been anti-treaty, but the labor movement kind of leadership itself goes with a pro-treaty um, line. It does it in, a, in an oblique way. Um, the final strike that, uh, that happens is one against um, the kind of civil war. So this happens on April the 24th, 1922, and the labor movement um, has this last kind of strike uh, incidental strike to try and take the gun out of Irish politics. Um, but it's saying that it's about, it's trying to stop both sides from, from like uh, fighting. But you can see from the statement from, from the trade union kind of leadership where it's kind of coming from at this time. So it says that Dáil Éireann is the sovereign assembly and the, the members have a, a, a like solemn duty to perform, and it's for them to reunite the army and bring it under a single kind of command, and that we should really let the Adal sort this out. But the Adal is split, it's a civil war. I mean, that's what happens, so you pick a side. So by saying that the Adal is sovereign, more or less, kind of, it's, it's more or less kind of leaning towards the kind of treaty side rather than the anti-treaty side. This, this, this really damages a labor in Dublin particularly, and Fianna Fáil, of course, just a clean up. So as soon as kind of Fianna Fáil kind of emerges in, in, in like 1927, it takes that anti-treaty uh, working class Republican vote and just owns it and owns it for like 50, 60 years. Um, we also see in the, in the anti-treaty side, there's, a, a, there's an awareness that there is, a, that the civil war is a class war. That there are class interests that are that are being protected by this kind of new state, and and Liam and Liam and Liam kind of Mellows has his role to kind of mass uh, like moment while in kind of Mount Joy, and says that we are forced uh, to recognise whether we like it or not that the commercial interests, the so-called money, and the Gombe men are on the side of the treaty because treaty means imperialism and England. Now, the large swathes of the Irish labor movement did not need to be told by Lee Mellows this was the case. They weren't stupid. They had worked it out themselves, but there's a real problem in terms of that. There's no real kind of sense of embracing that. For understandable reasons, there's a civil war kind of going on, but that lesson did not come from Mellows. They did not need a letter from Mellows to like, tell them that. They had worked it out themselves. And we can see that even in terms of, I'll jump up just in the last slide then. Um, when the civil war kind of settles down, uh, the Workers' Republic um, 
you know, makes it clear in its imagery just where it sees this new kind of free state and his interest, Alex served in it. And even the like Voice of Labour um, has this on its front page. It's a it's a cartoon and and the caption is it's a capitalist kind of politician saying that sacrifices must be made on the altar of national prosperity. Shut shut up the line that was used by the Fianna Fáil and and by Fianna Gael and by Labour from from 2007 up to 2014 as well. So there was a growing awareness. There was a complete kind of awareness of the class nature of the um, of the new state uh, that was emerging. But to argue as 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 a lot of kind of middle class Irish historians have, that there's nothing to be said really about labor and kind of working class kind of movements during this period because of labor, because of one phrase said by Dev that labor must wait, is a complete and utter ridiculous statement to make in light of the massive amounts of, of, of evidence to show that this was easily by far the most intense activist period for kind of working class kind of uh, you know people, um, up until really until the nineteen sixties. Excellent, Connor. Good kid, Moigat. Um, fantastic. And maybe we'll come back to some of those points um, at the end. I'd like to introduce Liz Gillis. Yeah, I would like to say thanks a million for asking me to take part um, in today's forum. And uh, as you can see, what I'm going to talk about and really I'm just scratching the surface on this is. Uh, the socio-economic uh, impact of the Irish Revolution on women. Um, and I'm going to go back to, to 1914 because I do include that, I see that very much as part of the revolution and looking at the 1914 lockout um, where we have the Jacob workers, the women's workers and Jacobs who went out on strike um, in support of the ITGW workers and a part of the 1914 lockout. Um, and we're the last to go back or amongst the last to go back um, when the strike did end in 1914. And they were um, really affected uh, by their trade union activities because some like Rosie Hacker, who you see in the photograph there, they didn't get their jobs back. Um, she had been uh, a, a worker in Jacob. She had been organising for the IWW um, since 1911 in Jacobs. And she's just one example of uh, workers, women, not getting their jobs back because of their union activities. Now, to counter this, um, because James Connolly and Delia Larkin and so on realised that people were being really affected because of their trade union activities and um, to combat that and to help those workers that could not get work and um, they set up the co-op in Liberty Hall. So you have women like Rosie Hacker and you can see from this statement, this is uh, Helena Maloney's witness statement, where she says that a small cooperative store had been established in Liberty Hall by Miss Delia Larkin during the strike. Miss Larkin had gone back to England when her brother Jim went to America. There was a little short making factory as well as the shop specialised in the workman short, the red hand, which retailed at two and six. The concern gave employment to eight to ten girls, none of whom could get employment as they were marked men on account of their strike activities. Now that um, that that workshop, that, that co-op then feeds into 1916 because the shorts they were making um, were actually part of the uniform for the Irish Citizen Army that took part in the East Horizon. But Rosie Hackett's trade union activities, um, they didn't cease when the revolution was over. For war, and like so many women that I've researched, um, social justice and social awareness was part, a very important part of the revolution. So you've got the military political revolution, but the social revolution was to come. And that was a much, much longer fight. And you see Rosie being involved with uh, Louis Bennett, um, in the laundry worker strike um, in 1940s, 1950s, where they successfully got the two week paid holiday. And that was women that were driving that. Um, and you have these women who had been out in 1914, past revolution, continuing that revolutionary activity. But you can see just from that one instance that women were directly affected by the events of 1914 and for their involvement in the strike. And when we come to 1916, 
we do hear about the the widows and the, the famous widows are uh, Muriel uh, sorry um is Grace Gifford uh Muriel McDonough and so on but one woman who I think is really really forgotten amongst the widows is Lily Connolly and the saying I was, we all heard it behind every great man is a great woman well this that saying certainly applies to Lily Connolly. That woman was struggling um, for all her married life to James Connolly. And he could not have done what he did um, without the support of Lily. While he was traveling to America and so on, building up his trade union activities, trying to get a little bit of work, she was keeping everything going at home. And a very principled man, um, Lily seen the, the everyday realities of life because with very little money coming in to the family home, um, she just got things done. He didn't like taking handouts, didn't like people, you know, giving help. She saw kids starving or principals, I'll feed the kids. So a very, very practical woman that you see in across the board, and you still see that um, across the board when it comes to, to, to women and raising their families and their uh, principles being put to one side. But when it came to 1916, and of course James Connolly, as you know, uh, he was horrifically wounded during the Easter Horizon. Um, despite the fact that he was dying from his wounds, he was executed in Khmer Jail on 12th of May 1916. Um, what is heartbreaking to read after the revolution is over is the, the pension files um, that are online from military archives. And to see the letters that are written by the widows, by the mothers, by the dependents of those who died during 1916 through the Civil War. And Lily Connolly, this was a letter that was sent into um, the Minister for Defence, Richard Mulcahy, um, in 1924. Now, again, Lily and the Connolly family had struggles, you know, throughout. They knew struggles. But after James Connolly's death, um, there was a lot of um, um, harsh times. Um, and that went across the board for everyone. But you can see from this letter, um, and I'll just read it there, so, uh, dear General Mulcahy, some months ago, Mrs. James Connolly applied for a pension under the Army Pensions Act. So the first Army Pensions Act was 1923-24. It was given to people who had um, gone for treaty and generally the widows and people who had died in 1916 and dated this 1924. This is important. Um, but so far has not had any word about our claim and has no idea as to when it's likely to be dealt with. This is a 1916 widow. She has found it rather difficult to make ends meet during recent years, um, and at the present moment, rather embarrassed, uh, rather embarrassed um, for the want of some ready money. So this is a woman who is actually struggling to put bread on the table. She's one daughter who's a medical student during last year, and um, she'll qualify in the next six or eight months. And um, perhaps you would be able to inform me whether it's likely that our claim would be disposed of at an earlier date and whether it would be possible for you to do anything to speed the aid of being dealt with. And if in the event of there being any considerable delay in the matter, whether it would be possible for her to get payment on account. Now this is the widow of James Connolly, a leader of 1916, who was not getting a, a, a pension in relation to her husband dying, a woman who was struggling. And Fair play to Richard Mulcahy, and um, this was his response. Um, and you can see it there, attached, and this obviously was not a unique situation. And um, from my understanding and from reading these letters, it is just basically that the pension board did not want to give money really to anyone. Um, but attached is one of the type of cases. So one of the type of cases, so he has come across this before, um, which I was speaking to you about, and one which is, is utterly inexcusable, has not been dealt with us long ago. It, now, and this is the, 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 state, the, the sentence that really, really brings it home. It should not take one day to get evidence that James Connolly was executed in 1916 because to get the pension, you had to provide documentation, death certs and so on, and um, prove that your loved one, or if it was you that applied for pension, had done what you had said you, were going, you had done. Um, Number two, it should not take one other day to verify that the applicant is his widow. So on top of 
the, the, the worry that this woman had trying to keep things together, trying to hold things together, keep her family together, keep her family fed. This is what she had to deal with to prove that she was married to James Connolly and to prove that he died in 1916. Um, and again, um, Mulcahy continues, pensions uh, might have some appreciation that a woman loses her husband and has a family that she has been through very difficult circumstances and is actually and is actually in very difficult circumstances at the present time, whatever bit of luck even may come her way. Um, and he says, is there any chance of having a forced payment of a pension? Lily Connolly should not have had to go through that. But I imagine she is the tip of the iceberg. Um, it did get resolved um, thanks to Richard McCain. Um, and she was not the only one. As I said, Agnes Mallon, a lot of the 1916 widows, um, some of them, some of the more well-known ones, um, they were looked after by the Irish National Aid Volunteer Dependence Fund, which was set up by Kathleen Clark and Sorkin McMahon. Um, it was sort of run by Common Amon, who went around gathering the information and collecting funds and distributing the funds. But even there, you had a hierarchy. Um, Agnes Mallon, the widow of Michael Mallon, um, who again had suffered tough times. There was always sort of a struggle. They had owned a shop. Um, in Mead Street, my area, um, during the lockout, but they lost their business during the lockout. He became a full-time organiser um, for James Connolly, for the trade union movement. Um, but her payment, she actually received less um, than the other widows because it was based on Michael Mallon's wages and actually not what he had done in the Easter Rise. And so even though he was commandant um, in Stephen's Green, was executed, in the, uh, in the aftermath of the rising, poor compensation was lower to that of other widows because it was based on his earnings. Um, moving on to the War of Independence, and whereas 1916 is pretty much Dublin Central, War of Independence, different story. Um, there was a lot of hardship put on women because especially as the war went on, you had members of the Irish uh, Republican Army going on the run. Now, especially around the country, um, you had women who basically became the breadwinner, um, running the household, running the farms, um, looking after the kids. And in some cases, um, as in you'll see in a few moments, um, in the case of the Hales family in Bandon, County Cork, um, the family home was completely destroyed by the Crown forces. Because with the arrival of the Black and Tans and later the auxiliaries in 1920, you have the policy, the unofficial policy force of uh, reprisals. So if there was an IRA ambush um, and members of the Crown Forces were killed, generally, very, very quickly after that, a reprisal would follow. Co-ops were targeted and um, family homes were targeted. Um, and the fear that was placed on women because it was women that would be in the homes at night because the men were on the run. And there was, it has been a lot of work done into this on the um, recently, and was program recently on the violence against women, both sides. Um, so this was another aspect. So the women were on the front line there. Um, and you can see from this photograph, this is taken during the, um, the Labour Commission's visit to Ireland. In 1920, the British Labour Party sent over a commission to see what was happening in Ireland. And the woman in the middle, well, the two women, sorry, the first woman um, on the left is Maud Gone. Some of you are probably well aware of Maud Gone, an amazing woman. And then in the centre is Charlotte Despard, another amazing woman. So she came to Ireland um, during this time little um, sort of conflict within the family because her brother was uh, Lord French, who was the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. So while he's trying to crush the IRA and subjugate Ireland, she's there sort of supporting and throwing her a lot with the Republican movement. Um, but it seems that after this, Charlotte Descartes moved full time to Ireland and throws in her police support with the Republican movement. And Horton Montgomery became great great friends and Charlotte Despard is a historian in our own right but she traveled around the country and um, with the others to find out what was going on on the ground to find out what was not being reported in official media because there were so many reprisals 
and if there are horrible stories of women um, witnessing what was going on in their towns. Um, after the Renine ambush in Clare in September 1920, you have um, a number of towns that were destroyed by the Crown forces. Um, a lot of men um, killed in front of their wives. So you have this whole trauma that was then thrown on to the women. So they're trying to basically keep things together, but not knowing what was going to happen one minute to the next. Um, and unfortunately, during conflict um, in wars, it is the civilians that are on the front line and no more so than in Ireland. Um, the Labour Commission, um, as far as I know, it is online, it was digitised, so well worth having a read of if you can get a chance to do that. Now, I briefly mentioned Madge Hales um, in, in relation to the War of Independence, just to give you a, a, a background to Madge Hales and her story. So her family, where the, the Hales family from West Cork, the famous West Cork family, um, had been involved in the struggle from very early on. But they were so well known. Her brother Tom was the commandant of the Tour West Cork Brigade. Um, Sean, Robert, Liam, they're all involved. Donald involved over in um, Italy. He was the Republican consul there. Um, but because the family were so well known, the brothers all had to go on the run. It was too dangerous um, for the family to stay there, for the brothers to stay there. So they had a big farm. Um, and it fell the responsibility of keeping that farm going fell to match. Now, she herself was a Republican, um, but she was also a daughter and a sister and had to basically keep the, the income coming in. Um, their farm hand was um, killed by the Crown forces um, and in an ultimate act of revenge because um, the, the Hales family were involved in a lot of um, attacks against the Crown forces in the Round Band. And um, the Essex Regiment, where the uh, British uh, Army unit based down in Bandon, in the Round West Cork. And um, the family home was completely destroyed. It was literally the four walls, like sort of what we've seen with that previous photograph, literally the four walls left standing. So here was a woman who had nothing. Her mother and father, her father had suffered a nervous breakdown um, due to the events, due to the family home being destroyed. Constant raids on the family home, looking for our brothers. The worry of what was happening to our brothers, because Tom had been arrested, suffered brutal torture at the hands of uh, the Essex Regiment. What was going to happen? Was that going to happen to our brothers? So you have all of this worry um, that she was dealing with. And sort of a bit like with Lily Conley, um, you have this letter um, to W.T. Cosgrave, um, because although the family didn't apply for a pension, they were um, suffering um, financial difficulties, because in the Civil War, um, this family split. So you had Sean Hales, our brother and Madge, that accepted the treaty, and rejecting the treaty where her other brothers Tom, Robert and Liam. And Sean Hales was actually assassinated up in Dublin on the 7th of December 1922. Um, and we know then the next day, um, from Pat O'Donnell's writings in the gates flew open, um, you have the four men being executed in Mountjoy Jail, including Liam Mellow, Rory O'Connor, um, as a reprisal or in response to the assassination of Sean Hales. He was the breadwinner of that family because the other brothers being on the street, you on the run, they weren't earning because also they had been arrested during the Civil War. So Sean was the breadwinner. As the eldest um, of member of the family, the farm would, the running of the farm would fall to him. They had literally nothing. And this is a begging letter that we have here. Now, our mother, um, as you'll see from the letter, very, very proud woman. But Madge wrote this letter in secrecy. She didn't want her mother to know because her mother was so proud. And she's setting out what the family circumstances are, that after Sean's death, they really had nothing. They were really struggling. They got a small bit of compensation to rebuild the house. But as you can see from this letter, um, that's only one of their problems. 
the father had suffered a nervous breakdown. He was now in a nursing home. Um, they couldn't afford to keep him in the home. And this is a letter applying for money to try to keep our father in the home because if they can't, what was going to happen? Um, and this was the realities of the war. Um, I don't think a lot of people that were, were involved in the conflict, and um, certainly a lot of women that were not involved in the conflict did not expect things like this to happen, but this was the impact of the war. And I am literally scratching the surface with this because there are so many different angles that you can go off into um, in terms of the, the relationships that women had. Um, you know, women did go out with, with British soldiers. There was a, a, a repercussions to that, that women were targeted um, for going out with British soldiers or members of the Crown Forces. You also had, on the other side, that women who were uh, sympathising with the Republican movement were also targeted for their activities. You have in some cases where women were being targeted as in, in intelligence books to be watched by intelligence officers for their activities with the Crown Forces. And of course then we have the whole moral implication what the women had or what the women, some of the women had to do. Because during this war, there were just physically some things that the men could not do. The, the reality um, that men could not go up to get information, gather intelligence, and get guns from British soldiers. Um, it just would not work. So who were asked to do this? Who were asked to befriend the soldiers to get the information, to get the weapons? Um, it was the women. And they did that. And you have one girl um, from Galway, and she said that that was actually the worst aspect of everything that she did, because she would have to go to a pub by herself and sit there while everyone was looking at her, judging her, um, and then befriend a soldier, bring him away, bring him to a secluded spot where members of the IRA were waiting um, to basically take their guns from them. Um, and what is really sad about that is that that was then used against the women later on when they wouldn't go back into their box, when they wouldn't be the, the quiet little women um, that they were meant to be. So what I've sort of just shown you there is a snapshot of different aspects of how the revolution impacted on women, both participants, non-participants, witnesses, um, the story of the revolution is everyone's story, men, women, kids, and the records that are being released now are helping us to tell that story. We're getting uh, this, the really important thing is that we're getting the stories of the working class people as well. Um, I'm finding from, in my area, so I'm from the Liberties, and there really was said that there was not much that happened in the Liberties. My God, there's so much to happen in the Liberties. There's raids everywhere. Me Street was getting raided left, right, and centre. And um, so these records are helping to to let us explore that history, tell those stories, and certainly from the perspective of the women on how they were impacted, both as participants, non-participants, witnesses, civilians. Um, thanks very much. Well done. Excellent. Fantastic. And I, I think it did. Three fantastic contributions and from very different perspectives and uh, from the personal to the international. Um, uh, can I ask, um, given that the main theme of this, this uh, Zoominar is Labour will wait no longer, can I ask, given that James Connolly foretold the betrayal of the working class um, and organised an armed um, an army to defend the rights of the working class. Why in this period, firstly, did workers and did the labour movement realise um, and foresee the potential for portrayal? Um, and secondly, why did they not arm themselves as um, in the way that Connolly had and continue on um, defending and um, demanding their rights in, in the, the revolutionary way that they were prepared to support the peers. Could we ask Connor first? 
Uh, yeah, okay. Um, I'll, I'll try and answer that anyway. But like, um, like to like for me, kind of what strikes me is that uh, they did arm, they they did organize, they did get guns. As Liz said, uh, at the liberties, but it, it was as active as you know as like anywhere else, like you know. But I think like the conclusion I've come to was that up until 1922 there are multiple islands that are being fought for because it hasn't like independence hasn't happened so in its absence it, 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 it can be anything and it can be all things to all men and and women and you fight for that vision that's in your head and the one that you share and you're being told that you know when the revolution comes, when we get an independence, it will have all these things. And what happens in like 1921, um, from well after kind of December 1921, is that certain interests are being kind of uh, uh, protected, and um, but that leads to the civil war, you know. So I mean, like the civil war itself is a lot more kind of complicated than what's been kind of made out, you know, like. Um, I'm not one for burning books. I don't believe in it. But if you could burn every copy of of the movie kind of Michael Collins, I would. It's done. It's it's done so much damage. It's just done so much damage. The North, Mick. The North. You know, like fuck off. You know, I mean, absolute nonsense. Like you know, and it's just not, it's done so much damage to that kind of view of the whole period. There were multiple ones, and people were fighting for that vision that they shared with their friends and with their families and they fought for it. And that was kind of betrayed. So one, one particular Ireland kind of wins true. And, and the Ireland that wins true is one that, that protected banks, uh, ranchers, the cattle industry. Um, that's what was, that's what was kind of protected. And, um, and, and, you know, these are the arguments that Larkin made. Like Larkin, when he comes back, after I think in like 1923, when he gets released from like Sing Sing, and he's a very different man. Um, but he 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 realized the kind of class nature of the of the Civil War, that what was being kind of fought for here. I mean, even because like he knew it from the like 1913, like the two people, like there were two people who knew what 1913 was really about, and it was William Martin Morphy. And it was Jim Larkin. And what they were fighting for was everyone knew that home rule was coming down the line. So what Millie Martin Murphy was fighting for was to break the back of the labor movement before home rule happened. That was the idea of it. Larkin got that. He saw it and he got it. That lesson was lost, you know, in 1917 until 1922. Larkin... He was, he was very bitter about it, but for good reason. He knew what that fight was about. He knew what 1913 was about. It was not about trade union kind of recognition. It was about what, what would be the role of trade unions in the home rule Ireland that's coming down the line. And Murphy said, I'm going to break them. That's what's going to happen here. And he did it until 1917. So elements knew what was coming down the line. Elements knew what was going on but when you're in that kind of situation there are multiple Ireland's that are at play one Ireland kind of wins true and it's a very conservative blue shirt one and of course then they write the history I mean Irish history was written by blue shirts and that's why the people that Liz kind of talked about and women as well are just pushed to one side and when women are brought into the narrative it's in a very passive way it's as victims and not as actual as like Liz said, as participants in this, you know, a very active kind of participants in all of this. Given that um, Labour didn't organise itself as a separate army much after the 16, um, and the demise of the Citizens Army in reality, um, but the women's movement did arm separately and uh, in the form of common demand and had um, not only um, a strong social pro pro um, manifesto and uh, set of demands, but also um, had very strongly understood the role of um, taking on the state um, in that context. Um, 
what happened to such militancy um, and where did it go and how was it dissipated? <laughs> they didn't go away. Um, they maybe were quietened a little bit, but and it took an awful lot of efforts for them to quieten those women. But can I just say, um, just because there are sort of similarities between, obviously, obviously you said there, the Labour and the, the women's movement, um, the conscription crisis, um, in 1918 was a, 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 a watershed moment for the women of Ireland. It politicised so, so many women. Um, a bit like what 1913, O'Donnell and Ross's funeral, 1915, did. there's these moments that just awaken something in people. Um, and you had, as we've talked about, the strikes in support of conscription, but the women, and this brought Labour and coming and Mon and all of these different strands um, together. They had their own day in response to conscription threat, which was Law and Mon. And it was their own um, uh, con uh, pledge that the women came up with, that they would not take the place of any man of the workforce that was forced to be conscripted, that was forced into the British Army. Um, but two swords of the women of Ireland signed this pledge. Um, now, where you had with the, the volunteer movement, when that threat of conscription was there, you've got numbers, you know, joining the volunteers, there's volunteer companies everywhere. But as soon as the threat passed, those numbers dwindle away and you're left with the, the elite, the, the, the die-hard, radical elements of the volunteers. The opposite happened with the women. Branches of coming among were set up all over the place because that moment awakened something in those women. So you have organisers being sent all around from Dublin to organise branches of coming among. And the very important thing about this was women knew they were getting the vote. Women over 40 knew they were going to get the vote when the next general election happened. But what Lana Mon gave those women was the young women the opportunity to have a voice and to have a say. And their part is bigger. So what the opposite um, happens with the volunteer movement. The numbers dwindle. We're coming on, it gets stronger, stronger and stronger. Now, some women um, that were citizen army retained their membership of the citizen army. They always referred to themselves as members of the citizen army. Um, and then when it came to the treaty, um, the women were the very first organisation to have a, a convention on whether they as a body would accept or reject the treaty. That happened in February 1922. The IRA's one was in March 22. Um, and the women were sort of the ones that were blamed for causing the, the civil war, for using emotional language. And, you know, but you read it all debates, there's a lot of emotional language coming from the fellas as there is from the women. Um, they said that the women, you know, um, you know, used their dead relatives. Um, it was Mrs. Pierce that did that. The women that spoke in the doll against the treaty were speaking from their own experience because they had been involved. Kansas Margaret and so on, she herself had been sentenced to death. Um, the women were really, really, really active in the Civil War because um, so many men were arrested. But the, the thing was that the women were not being arrested by the authorities because of the nature of the work they were doing. So the pro treaty side just got around that by amending um, the emergency legislation that had been brought in. Um, and it basically boiled down to that if they thought you were going to do something, they could arrest you. So hence you have a load of women being arrested in uh, February, March 1973. And then when it was all over, someone had to get the blame. And it was easy enough to blame the women. Um, a lot of what they had done, and I sort of mentioned that in the talk, that stuff that the women did that was accepted and that was known in the War of Independence, that they could only do was then used against them um, by their former, by their enemies um, in the, when it was all over. Um, P.S. O'Hergerty called Mary McSweeney a sea green and corruptible. You know, there were Amazonians, all these derogatory terms. Um, and they were, they basically tried to silence them. Um, but they didn't give up without a fight. Coming them on, we're still around, Easter Lily. Um, they were the ones that introduced the Easter Lily to raise funds for um, the, the, the Republican uh, prisoners and so on. So they just were, were sort of 
forced into the background, but then you see them coming out again in the 1930s in response to the conditions of employment bill. You've got both free state or pro-treaty women and treaty women coming together to unite, to, to fight against that. Um, and other events that happened, the constitution and so on. Um, but they, they, they weren't necessarily in the forefront, but they were still very active. And in some cases, Selena Maloney, Mara Comerford, um, diehard Republicans right up until the day that they died. And they were influencing uh, uh, Nora Conley O'Brien, all of those women that had that connection back to 1916 to 1913, were still influencing people right up through the 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, so maybe not having a big platform, but still making a big difference um, under the radar, which is what they're very good at as well. Okay, and um, well done. And um, previous previous speaker um, talked and referred to um, the inheritors of um, of 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 this time and of this movement um, to be Sinn Féin. Now, given the history of um, Sinn Féin movement of the time, which appears to have, in its vagueness of demands was able to park and um, subsume the interests of labor uh, it, it, within the national within the national cause to the point where labor was prepared to wait what would your uh, individual advice for workers organizing now is it possible to work within a broad front coalition and um, not to have to wait again um, is it possible to bring forward workers' demands, and the demands of labour within um, a, a coalition of classes uh, and a, or a movement that's based on a coalition of classes? I think that would be extremely difficult at the, at the present time, given that la the Labour Party, which should be representing social democracy, has shrunk and has little appeal and this is manifested repeatedly in its electoral failures. Um, this has left a gap in Irish political society, which I think Sinn Féin is attempting maybe at the moment to hoover up some of that uh, gap where people are looking for a representation of a political representation of Labour, much as they might have seen in the UK, but it's not there. And they, I, I think the, the demands of the trade union movement are too modest at the moment, much too modest for the emerging um, economy and non-representative workplaces and still high emigration and Many of the features that Connor has described for the earlier period of the last century still apply now, in that many are of the of the youth are disenfranchised. They find nobody to vote for, nobody that even slightly represents their turmoil and their very precarious or precarious existence. So I. I think that the, it's very difficult to have inter-class alliances. And what, what in fact would be helpful is if there were a Labour Party advocating some kind of social democracy. But we see that in the North as well. The SDLP, its vote has collapsed. Its party structure has collapsed. Indeed, even the Labour Party's local structures have effectively collapsed. And all that's left is a television image of um, Sinn Féin, which naturally uh, it, it, it uses to the, to the best of its effect. Um, but there is, there is the absence of such forums even to discuss and debate um, a political way forward. Liz, again on, on the question of is it possible that class coalitions um, and parties based on class coalition and broad fronts can deliver for Labour? 
Um, I agree with Pauline. I don't, I don't think so. I honestly don't think so. Um, and it's unfortunate because a lot of us are in the same boat now. Um, the you know you're seeing with the generation of working class communities, there's there's it, it's changing the dynamic um, of the community. So you are seeing a mix of you know uh, the, say wealthier people with you know working class people and so on. Um, but what I'm seeing is that's just changing the voting pattern. It's not changing it for the better. Um, I'm speaking as like saying that from my own perspective because I'm seeing it here um, in Dublin 8. Um, and it's a, <clears throat> I'd say people over in Church Street and so on are seeing the same way, seeing this regeneration that's going on on the name of, you know, progress. There's nothing wrong with regeneration. But why is the existing community getting pushed out? The community that has been there is a working class community that have, you know, seen the highs and lows. You know, when, when people hadn't got an interest and you did have certain groups, um, certain politicians that, you know, did have an interest and tried, like we had John Gallagher. Oh my God, if we had John Gallagher in, in I don't know if anyone remembers John Gallagher, a councillor for Labour. Oh my God, that man was the heart of the liberties. We need more John Gallagher's because he did cross that uh, divide um, and did saw, you know, how he could represent everyone but the heart of his politics was the community that was there and ensuring that community stayed um that is getting diluted now and you're seeing the the change in the vote and it's it's no i i don't see it um you know it's it's swinging it's not working together okay and finally connor if you would just to try again to answer the question of um why Labour waited and was um, the, in their involvement in the broad coalition of a national movement causal in its um, inability to achieve its aims? Yeah, I mean, yeah. well, yeah, just first of all, I mean, I, I mean, I would, I would kind of reject that kind of view that Labour waited. I, I would just be lost, but that's different from, from, from waiting. And um, and the waiting kind of narrative again, it goes back to agency. I think that it's a it's a very concerted, you know, there's a there's a concerted effort here by kind of blue shirt kind of, uh, historians to to get away to emasculate uh, the working class and our struggles and women as well um, for for kind of, for ideological reasons. Um, labor lost is a different argument from from labor waited. It's a much, it's a much more difficult art. It's a much difficult one, you know. It's a different dynamic to everything, you know. La Labour lost after 1922, but it didn't wait. I mean, like, just the evidence is like it is is kind of overwhelming. But Particularly like, that question, Connor, that um, uh, Rand is Labour repeating the same mistake by um, largely focusing on the broad front and being involved in in various political bodies that um, are class are cross class based yeah i mean yeah. you know like like having a cross class based party um there's no such thing that i would say because just just based on on like on historical examples parties that are cross party for some reason tend to push a kind of middle class agenda anyway you know um so, so the support tends to be cross class, but the outcome doesn't, <laughs> you know. So, I mean, um, I think, like, if you have lessons from from nineteen twenty, from seventeen to kind of twenty two, is that putting all your eggs into the kind of political basket, which I think is what you, it, it, which I think is what you're asking, isn't it? You know, today, but the lesson there is that no, you don't do that. But equally, you don't put all your eggs into the trade union basket or into the community organizational basket. You really need all three. Um, there was one argument made, which, which also kind of struck me from in, in the kind of debates leading up to whether Labour should, or the trade union movement should field kind of candidates in the December, in the November, no, in the December 1918 general election and and the debates are in the annual kind of report of it 
there was an argument made by the Northern uh, reps who had said that um, you can't go, like if you run candidates, you have to go to Westminster. That's what we agreed. Um, you can't run on an abstentionist kind of policy. That's a, that's a Republican one. And, um, and we're, and, you know, and we agreed not to do that. So how he did it was they, they just didn't stand any candidates. And that's how I think about kind of argument. But the, but the rationale I thought was quite interesting. What they argued for and the compromise which the trade union movement, which unlike a nationalism was cross by community, it did involve kind of unionists. It did involve, you know, it did have loyalist kind of members. But what they agreed, their compromise was, wherever power happens, we need to be there. So if decisions are been taken, are been taken that affect working class lives, be they in Dublin or in Westminster or in Belfast, Labour needs to be at that table. And what Labour movement did in 1918 was that it blinked, it walked away from that because it didn't want to get on to, do you... If you stand for Labour candidates, do you take seats in, in like Westminster? If you take them, you're, you're kind of going against the mood of this. If you don't take them, you've lost the north. So they just avoided it. Um, but I like that argument. I like that point. Wherever power happens, we need to be there. So putting everything into how, how I think you keep kind of politicians on the straight and narrow is having a very strong movement outside of politics that can put pressure on like politicians when they get in. When, if, you, if we fall into the argument of, of kind of electoralism only, where you put everything in the getting candidates kind of elected, I think you will, you're selling yourself short. Like for one example is the, is the war protests in the South um, from, 2014 until 2016, and um, put enormous pressure on like, politicians while still staying, but while not fielding kind of candidates, but it, but been able to mobilize hundreds of thousands of people and put them on the streets. It kind of kept like well-meaning kind of politicians. It kind of kept them on a very short leash, and I think that's a good that's a good kind of that's a good kind of policy you know can going forward, organized kind of locally. Um, uh, speak softly to kind of politicians, but always carry a big stick. I think we we'll leave it there. That's a good, a good tactics. <laughs> the big stick. Okay. Listen, I'd like to thank you very much for your fantastic. Contribution.